Okay, so uh, sorry for the delay. And uh, the next speaker and the last speaker is uh, David Munoz. He will be talking about temporal network analysis using zigzag precision, please. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you for the organizers to, for having me. I'm um, very glad to be part of this workshop. Um, I will be talking about um, temporal network analysis using zigzag persistence. This is joint work with Aaron Myers, uh, Piraz Kosone, and Elizabeth Munch. So first of all, what are we interested in? In general, uh, we are studying temporal networks. So any graph or network that changes through time. Um, here are a couple examples. In the left, um, this is a network um, from 28 zebras that were like observed during uh, two months, and we can draw edges between uh, two zebras where they, in a day where they were uh, seen together, and we get this kind of uh, network. And in the right, we have the two examples that we studied in the uh, paper. The first one is a uh, transportation network in Great Britain. And the second one is using ordinal partition networks from time series. I will define that later. So our goal is to use zigzag persistence to study the structure of these networks. So uh, finding how the structure changes in time. Um, this is some related work in this uh, similar um, context from Wijin Kim and Pakundo Memoli. Uh, they use a concept uh, called Formigram. Uh, this is restricted to um, zero dimensional components, so connected components. Um, so in our case, we will be interested in higher dimensional persistence. So our approach will be um, different. Uh, we will see first some background, the basics from all that we need to apply our method, then how we apply our method, and then the two examples that we studied. Uh, first of all, zigzag uh, persistence. Yesterday, uh, Sarah Timochko talked about this. And she explained it pretty well, so I won't get much into detail. But the general, um, the important part is that in zigzag persistence, we don't need to have a filtration. So we don't um, require the inclusions to be uh, in the same way. We will have in general this setting where we have uh, inclusions going left and right, altern alternated. Um, then we will be working with graphs, and for these graphs, we'll be using the ribs complex of these graphs. Um, uh, so the distance in the graphs is defined as the length of the shortest path between the between any two nodes, and we will be working with undirected graphs, so it will be uh, symmetric. Here we have an example. So in the top, we have a graph and the matrix of uh, distance, the distance matrix, so the shortest uh, path matrix. And then here we have the ribs complex for uh, different ranges. So first, if we take the parameter R equal to zero, we get the, it would be the point cloud, which in this case is the set of vertices of the graph. Then for R equal one, since we can only take uh, integer values, for R equal one, we will have um, all the edges in the graph, but uh, we will also have some two simplices whenever we have a triangle in the graph. And then so on, we have with higher uh, values, we will have more simplices. And then uh, a temporal network 
is defined as a fixed set of uh, vertices and then a uh, sequence of times where the edges are active. So here we have a example. We have here five vertices and then five edges that are active in different times. And what we will do in general is take these intervals of time and then uh, take like the graph snapshot, which would be um, taking all the edges that were active during this interval and putting that in a single graph. And we will always be using just the vertices that are connected to uh, some of the vertex. So we will never have um, isolate, um, isolated vertices in our setting. Uh, so now with all of these uh, definitions, here is how we will apply our method. First, we have a temporal network or temporal graph as just as I just said, a fixed uh, set of vertices and then a sequence of times where the edges are on or off. Then we will um, select the intervals in time to take the graph snapshots. And then again, we take um, the edges that were active during this each of these intervals and generate this sequence of, of graphs. Um, and then for the simplicial complexes, we will have a fixed R volume for the ribs complex. So we will obtain a sequence of simplicial complexes. And then uh, finally, we compute the zigzag persistence and the uh, persistent tiger. Um, here we have a example for this general um, procedure. Um, this is the same example as before. We have these graphs corresponding to each of the blue and red yeah. intervals. And then we can take the union of each two adjacent graphs. So we can obtain these inclusions uh, going right and left um, alternated. And then we get the zigzag structure here. And finally, we compute the, um, well, in this case, we can use the ribs complex of these graphs, but since we don't have any triangles, if we take R equal one, it will be the, the same exact thing as the graphs. And then uh, we compute the exact persistence. So in the diagram, we see uh, uh, the main connected component from the beginning to end. Then another connected component, uh, and one, which is here, the four and three um, edge, that it, uh, and then it connects to the other connected component at time three. And then we have the loops, uh, a small loop uh, here in four, and then the same loop, but later in time, at time six. So that is, that is the general um, method that we apply to our networks. The first example is the is a transportation network. So we have this data set of three uh, types of transportation in Great Britain, air, rail, and coach. Here are the, the uh, graphs. These are the total, like the accumulated graphs for these three um, uh, transportation methods. And this, uh, this is just each node is a station or um, destination. And then the edges are the trips or the connections between stations. Um, so with the departure and arrival times, we have these, we will have this sequence of times where the edges are on and off. So this data set was taken from one week, Monday through Sunday. And then um, for our analysis, we will use uh, windows or intervals of 20 minutes with an overlap 
of 50%. So the adjacent intervals will always be overlapped. Um, with, uh, oh, okay. Um, okay. Also, this 20 minutes uh, length was chosen uh, from the average waiting time of these um, transportation methods, which was about uh, seven minutes. So this guarantees uh, some connectivity between um, adjacent uh, intervals. So now we will try different values for the RIPS complex. Uh, for this, we use the coach data. Uh, so here we have three different diagrams in uh, dimension one. For this first one in the left, uh, we use the graphs directly from the network. So these, uh, we don't do the ribs complex here. We have the graphs and uh, we see this daily uh, increase of loops during the sort of the business hours. And then in the night, it uh, most of it dies. And then again, the same day, the next day, the same. And we see a little uh, less loops for Sunday. But as you can see, it is not very clear from that. But when we compute the ribs complex with R equal one, uh, much of this noise uh, is, um, is no longer there. And we can see these high persistence um, points each of the days from Monday to Saturday. And then on Sunday, uh, also just one and another one little under it. And then when we take R equal two for the ribs complexes, we see that these high persistence points are no longer there. Um, so we can see that in general, when we take the ribs complex, uh, we can we're able to clear up a lot of noise, but we also need to choose it carefully so that we don't lose information from these methods. Um, yeah, so for this application in particular, we will will we always use R equal one. So now we. we take the rail data, which is much bigger than the uh, previous one. And we will compare the results to these uh, standard connectivity and centrality uh, measures. I have the kind of the definition here. Maybe you have heard them before. The first two are just connected components and average size of connected components. And then these three are uh, degree between this and loadless. And we take the average of these of these three. So here we have um, the persistent diagrams on the top, and then these five uh, measures uh, below. In these figures, we can see in all of them we can see that daily uh, increase of activity during the day. That uh, in the night, most of it. Uh, shuts down and then again the next day. Um, so we can see very similar um, properties in both the diagrams and these, um, these measures. But the thing that we can point out here is that in zero dimensional, we see a high dimension, high persistence point um, from that goes, goes from Monday to Saturday. So that is telling us that the psychonaut connected component um, that survives uh, in these six days. And that is important because we cannot see these uh, connected component here in these other measures. So that's one of the things that uh, we can use. Um, we can see in persistence uh, homology and not in the other measures. Um, so now the second uh, example is using audio amplification networks. So the setup here is also as uh, Sarah Timochko yesterday, she ex she talked about this vector embedding uh, stuff. Um, 
So the first step here is the same. We have a time series, then we choose a dimension M and a delay tau, and we compute this uh, vector embedding. But now we take a different turn here and we use each of these vectors, we assign them to a permutation of M elements. So here we have uh, in the bottom the, the example too, which is much, uh, much more clear. When we have dimension three, we have three points for each uh, vector embedding. And then depending on the values of these three points, we assign this vector to one of the permutations. In this case, we have six possible permutations. Uh, so I have an example here. So it is uh, here. So here we have um, the time series coming from the sine function. And we have also dimension three. So we have six possible permutations. And for each of these uh, vector of three points in green, we assign that to one of the permutations uh, from pi one to pi six. And then what we will do is that we will build a graph with this, taking the vertices are, as all the permutations and then the edges are the uh, transitions between these permutations. Um, so in this case, we use all of them, the six permutations, and we see that uh, the edges are only connected between permutations that are um, um, adjacent in this um, graph. So again, we will only use the permutations that are that are um, assigned to some vector. So we won't have any, again, we don't have any isolates in these graphs. Um, yeah, so in this case, the sine function is, of course, uh, periodic. So we will get our graph will be uh, very nice, just a uh, cycle. Uh, so we apply this to um, a time series coming from uh, the Lorentz system. This is also um, that Sarah showed this uh, system yesterday um, that has a, like a butterfly shape. And then um, we will have some fixed parameters for the uh, differential equations and we will use the Z solution of this um, system. And then we use that uh, time series and use the ordinal partition network set up to study this. Um, so again, we use the, these five um, measures that we used before. And here we have the, the time series. And then with these measures, there is uh, not much we can identify clearly here. The blue regions in the top should be the periodic uh, windows in this signal. And we can see that there is some change in these measures in the, during the periodic windows, but it is not clear like the beginning at the end of, of these uh, windows. Um, so we will apply this with our method. Um, so here we have the one dimensional persistence diagram obtained from the zigzag persistence. And then what we can see is that um, the high persistence points in the diagram, so we see there are like five um, points that are Far from the diagonal, those five points um, correspond to each of these uh, periodic regions or windows in this um, uh, signal. And then we can also see that when a chaotic uh, window is here, we also see like multiple low persistence points in the diagram. Um, also, just have in mind that we are not varying the RIPS parameter. So this diagram is 
um, in time in the in the uh, network, it is not telling us like the size of of, of the cycle here. Um, other thing that we can point out is that uh, here we have these three um, snapshots of the graph, and we see here that this one in the the blue one has like a lot of uh, cycles around it, but uh, it maintains the like the general structure of the graph, and this is in here also in the diagram. We still see the high persistence point that maintains through all these uh, these part of the of time, but we also see a uh, one I think one um, low persistence point in this interval. Um, yeah, so in general, our general conclusions with this method is that we can uh, have like a very different, like new perspective of this um, study of um, temporal networks that, and we can see many things that are not seen in um, with the standard connectivity and central measures that we compared. And we can apply this also to any any temporal network. So I have some examples here: clock behavior models, power grid dynamics, supplier manufacturer networks, and also brain activity networks. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the some ideas for next applications to see how this method uh, tells new things about. Um, these methods. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Questions? Okay, actually, I have a question. Can you go back to the previous slide? Previous one, the one, yeah. So, uh, does how long a cycle persists in your module or in your filtration depends on the size of the cycle? Is it relevant? Is, is um, it true that larger cycles tend to persist longer or is it's is not really right? Um, I don't think so. I think it's like the general uh, structure of the graph, but um, yeah, it wouldn't be the size, but the, 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 how it maintains its structure through time. Um, hi, uh, I don't know if you've thought about this, but have you um, uh, looked at the potential applications of this in, let's say, something like temporal graph learning or for some sorts of uh, predictive uh, analysis tasks? That would be interesting, but no, we, we haven't. I Yeah. Yeah. So on the left green bar, there are two more strong, more persistent uh, components, and I suppose they roughly correspond to weekly and weekend. But like, how is it like? How do they show up in like the real way? Um. Well, we would need to maybe like track back uh, the representatives of these like uh, points. We didn't do that exactly. So we don't have like like the specific uh, meaning in that network, like the specific points and locations. But yeah, it's like showing the connectivity between the these six days So, which software do you use for zigzag? Um, Dynamics. <laughs> you should try this <laughs> software. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, well, our our data wasn't 
very big, so it wasn't. No, no, I'm just but, joking. <laughs> yeah, but sure, we we will. We also want to try that uh, algorithm for a bigger um, data set. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker again and. Uh, Thank you.